I think most of people <clears throat> got connected. So go ahead, introduce Chuck. So good night, everyone. Thank you for connecting with us for the, I believe, fifth uh, webinar of the fall series. Tonight, we have Dr. Chuck Astle. Uh, he's the uh, state veterinarian with Oregon State University. And he'll be talking about uh, mitigation of pain for calves undergoing uh, routine procedures. So if we do have questions, please use the chat box or the question and answer box here at the bottom of your uh, screen. And we can ask, ask those questions at any moment during the presentation. So Chuck, thank you very much for agreeing to participate tonight. And I'll let, give the floor to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ranches. Can everybody hear me? Somebody make a noise or something? Can you hear me, Juliana? I can hear you. I mean, I don't, I don't, they don't cannot, they cannot respond reply yeah. to you but i i think they can do <laughs> can hear yeah, you we didn't yeah. have this when i was raising my kids and make them be quiet for the night <laughs> shall be said on the chat that she can hear you so you're yeah. good to go so yeah we're going to focus Thank our you. attention tonight on the mitigation or prevention of pain for calves undergoing routine procedures so that includes castration dehorning uh, and branding and uh, I know this talk is going to make some of you uncomfortable. Many of us in the beef industry have been entrenched in our ways and tradition for decades and generations. Um, but I just encourage you to try to be open-minded to some of these ideas. It's, uh, if, if nothing else, the pandemic has taught us this is a new day and uh, things are not going on the way that they always have and probably things will be change forever and hopefully uh, the area of pain mitigation for production livestock uh, will be undergoing some changes forever uh, beginning now and on into the future. <clears throat> so the points I'd like to cover tonight are why pain management matters. So you know unless producers buy into this it's just not going to happen because there's generally there's nobody out there watching what you do and we have to do the right thing because we're motivated internally to do the right thing. Um, we'll spend some time on discussing what the current state of pain management is in cattle. Uh, and frankly, in the United States, it's pretty dismal, uh, especially compared to the European Union countries. We're going to we're going to go back uh, to college for a little. Whoops! Oh no! Everything just went away. Uh oh. <laughs> Let's see. Can you try to share again, uh, Chuck? Let's see. Am I on or off, Juliana? Yeah, you're in the first slide. Okay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, okay. So we're going to go back to school a little bit and talk about some pain physiology you know you can you can read that either way the physiology or of pain or the reviewing the physiology is a rather painful process it's it's very complicated with a lot of esoteric terms but i'll try and uh, break it down to make it understandable and it, it goes far beyond my depth of understanding i'm pretty much a boots on the ground veterinarian not a, not a laboratory or um you know theoretical veterinarian so uh, I'll try and keep that as, as simple as I can, but kind of give you some ideas why we recommend the things that we're recommending. Now we'll talk about recognition of pain. I'll give you a chance to uh, voice your own ideas on what some of the things cattle do when they're experiencing pain. And then, and then where, the, where the rubber meets the road and, and probably why most of you are here is what can we do about it? What are the practical ways to apply pain mitigation to my operation without totally disrupting uh, the entire process. So current industry practices, um, routine procedures, dehorning, branding, and castration. Actually, we have very little information available on the prevalence or how common is pain mitigation on any of these with the exception of dehorning. There's pretty good information from various surveys out there on dehorning. In Canada, about a fourth of the producers uh, and 92% of the veterinarians use nerve blocks. And that's one of the things that we're gonna to demonstrate toward the end of this discussion, how to do the horn nerve blocks so that those calves uh, don't feel the pain associated with dehorning. 
In the United States, however, only about 20% of the producers and veterinarians uh, actually use nerve blocks. Of course, most of the dehorning is going to be done by producers, uh, not veterinarians, but um, only about a fifth of us are using any pain mitigation at all. So this is a little bit uh, enlarged data from surveys, both in the, in the United Kingdom and in California. So in the United Kingdom, uh, at castration, and, and this, this applies to veterinarians, not to the producers, about three quarters of them use a local anesthetic. For dehorning, almost everybody uses a local anesthetic in both beef and dairy. Uh, in California, however, the percentage of veterinarians that use local anesthetic for castration is less than 20% for young calves and in older calves, uh, it's somewhere around 50%. Part of that is uh, they don't jump as much, so the veterinarian is not as likely to get hurt if they'll use some, uh, some pain relief in the form of local anesthesia. For disbudding or dehorning, and just to clarify terms, we use the term disbudding um, when we talk about removing the horn bud before it's really sticking up very far out of the head, and then the term dehorning when that uh, horn's uh, the size of a Hershey kiss or, or longer horns, uh, you know, on up to adult size. So I, I kind of tend to use them interchangeably, but uh, I, just, to, just to clarify the difference. So uh, in California, for calves less than six months, uh, about uh, two thirds of the veterinarians will use an anesthetic and in calves over six months, about three quarters of them. Um, another study um, done at Kansas State found that 22% of veterinarians um, in their state used anesthetic for castration. There was no data on uh, dehorning. And then another California study, Virginia Fate, uh, found uh, about a third of the veterinarians used anesthetic for castration of calves less than six months and uh, just over half used anesthetic for calves over six months. And then as far as dehorning, about two thirds used uh, some anesthetic for calves less than six months and about three quarters for calves over six months. And then another study in the UK done in 2017 uh, not too much change from the 2006 study. About two thirds of the veterinarians use an anesthetic for castration and uh, somewhere around 90% of them use the anesthetic for disbudding. So uh, you can see that the United States uh, lags a bit behind uh, the rest of the world in terms of pain mitigation for routine procedures. So why is that? Um, What's the reason we're so slow to adop adopt this? Well, right at the top of the list is um, we really don't have any drugs that are approved for pain relief in cattle in this country with the exception of the pour on banamine, which is actually only approved for foot rot. Um, so that means that in order to use drugs, you have to have a valid veterinarian client patient relationship and the veterinarian uh, has to prescribe those drugs for your use. And, as, and then he also or she uh, maintains responsibility for any residues or uh, any untoward effects. There may be some question about whether the drugs are efficacious. Um, we, we have some new tools in our uh, arm, arm of material now that are very effective. Um, so hopefully we can dispel that. Uh, it does require extra label drug use. Uh, meat and milk withdrawal, the drugs that I'll be talking about tonight have about a three week withdrawal. So for calves, that really shouldn't be an issue. Um, a lot of producers simply don't know what's out there, what they can use or how to use the tools that are available. So um, this is where a relationship with your veterinarian and spending some time going over standard operating procedures, protocols, and techniques uh, is time very well spent. I think one of the major limitations is the idea that this really slows you down. Um, you know, you're trying to process calves rapidly, uh, get them done. You got, you know, a hundred and some calves to do in a morning and other things to do. Um, and I'll, I'll try to show you some ways that can uh, be implemented so that this really doesn't slow down very much. And then lastly, the last impediment is probably cost. Um, with the drugs we have now, 
uh, cost is really a pretty minor factor. We're, we're talking around a dollar a calf uh, for castration pain relief. So hopefully we can address these and, and answer your questions. I'm gonna just take a look at the chat here. I see a couple things going on. Let's see. Oh, okay. Everybody's just glad they got here. Sounds good. All right. <clears throat> so why does pain management matter? Well, first of all, we're under increasing consumer pressure. There's actually a, um, a pizza, what's it called? California Pizza House or something that won't accept cheese uh, made from animals that have been dehorned. Uh, I think that's a little extreme, but uh, this is the way our society is moving. I think we're all pretty aware um, of what's going on with society as, as more and more people are further and further removed from agriculture they do tend to uh, anthropomorphize and, and kind of expect our farm animals to be treated by like their beloved cats and dogs. Um, so there's pressure to avoid painful practices when possible. When it's not possible, we're under pressure to reduce that pain in any way that we can. And, and uh, our consumers vote with their pocketbooks. Um, you know, we, we've seen that in the organic market. Now, there's, there's no reason that um, the consumer should really believe that organic meat is any better than conventional meat, but they have that belief and they're willing to pay for it in some circumstances. And then we as producers, we really need to advocate on behalf of our animals. Obviously they're silent, they can't advocate for themselves. And so as stewards of those animals, it's really our responsibility uh, to provide excellent care. Um, and so we can do that when we have the right knowledge, the tools and the skills to mitigate that pain. And it's just the right thing to do. I think we can uh, you know, go to bed at night uh, after a day of work in calves and lay down with a, uh, with a good feeling, knowing that we did all we can to make that animal's life better and to relieve the pain. Um, there've been a lot of studies looking at the economics of pain relief. Uh, and some of the early studies indicated that for example, with castration, pain relief uh, so reduced the, the amount of bovine respiratory disease with bulls going into the feedlot. Um, for dehorning, there's some pretty good evidence. There's an increase in average daily gain uh, for, for uh, stalker calves. And this is probably because they don't mind sticking their head uh, into the feed bunk. Uh, but honestly, overall, there's very little economic direct economic benefit to pain relief. And so uh, I, I wish there was, it'd make a, a, an easier sell to all of you, uh, but the data is just not there to support a strong economic incentive uh, for pain relief. But again, I, I just go, go back to this idea that pain relief is the right thing to do and our consumers are demanding it. And if we want our industry to be sustainable, uh, this is the direction we're gonna have to move in. <clears throat> So uh, effective pain management results in uh, faster recovery from illness. I think we've seen that using banamine and respiratory infections. And um, when we provide pain relief for castrated calves, they move better, they're gonna get up and down and they're gonna nurse more frequently. They won't have near as much of a setback. Uh, and one of, the, one of the most important points that I wanna stress tonight is it's more effective to prevent pain at the onset than to wait until an animal's painful and then go back and try to alleviate that. In other words, using pain medications before the painful procedure is way more effective, takes way less drug than waiting until the pain already exists. And, you know, those of you that, for example, have had, had a toothache, uh, especially us men, you know, we think it's manly to be stoic and say, no, I don't need, I don't need no drugs. I'm tough. I can take it. Uh, I got a high pain threshold. And uh, actually uh, that's counterproductive. If, if you take the pain medication at the first sign of pain, it won't take very much medication and it's gonna be effective and rather than waiting until you know, that, that tooth is throbbing and, and uh, just driving us nuts to where we just wanna crawl in a hole and die. And so we reach for the Advil or the Tylenol. Uh, in that case, it's not gonna be as effective. And the same principle applies here and I'll explain some of that on the basis of physiology. Um, and also continuous delivery of pain relief is more effective than periodic administration. This oftentimes is not very practical, but 
we do have uh, some drugs that, that last uh, for about 72 hours with a single dose. So at the time of dehorning, castration, branding, we can administer a drug uh, orally and, and expect it to last for about three days. Okay, so uh, if you want to share in the chat here, you've all had, had calves and, and done these procedures. Can you uh, share with the rest of us what some of the signs of pain are that you've observed? And then uh, after we do that, I'll, I'll give you some of the things that I've got jotted down on my PowerPoint. So y'all don't be shy here. What's a painful calf look like? How do you know when a calf's in pain? Okay, droopy ears. Uh, thank you, Shelby. That that's really common. You know, you you look at a group of calves when you go by. They're usually alert. Their their ears are up. They turn to look at you. But that calf's in a lot of pain. He's hanging his head down, and his ears are just kind of drooping. Uh, yeah, Quincy, uh, head shake. That's another good one. Especially with dehorning, they they're trying to you know to get that irritation off of their head. So head shaking, uh, even for a few days after dehorning, is pretty common. Uh, Juliana at, at it, uh, separated from the group. A lot of times, those calves will isolate themselves. They don't want that interaction with the other animals. The other animals bumping into them, licking them, uh, stimulating them to get up and down. So yeah, separation is is pretty common sign of pain. Those are all great. Um, Let's see, head down, Melissa added head down along with the droopy ears, separation from group. Any other ideas? How about a calf that's uh, just been castrated? How's that sucker walk for a few days? You know, when my students are quiet, I, I call on them, but I can't do that with you. Yeah, humped up, stiff, sore. Uh, he, he walks like the proverbial bow-legged cowboy. He doesn't want that inner thigh rubbing against uh, the area uh, of the scrotum where he's had that surgery done. Um, okay, I think, I think those are all, are all pretty good. Let me uh, go over a few that I had in my notes here. So uh, we talk about depression. Uh, really, that's a human term. That proper animal term would be obtunded. Uh, depression is a, a mental state, but I think we all know what it means. Uh, the, the things you've just said, the head down, the ears drooping, the lack of interest in the environment, they may not want to eat. It's, you know, if it's too painful to get up and walk to nurse and, or go to the feed bunk, they often make that decision to just stay put. You all mentioned the isolation, so they hide, they avoid those interactions, reluctant to move, they, they lay down. That little steer that's just been castrated may walk like he's lame, even though there's nothing wrong with his feet or legs. It's just he doesn't want those thighs uh, touching the surgical site. Abnormal posture, uh, Melissa put in her chat humped up, and, and that's exactly right. A lot of times uh, when they have pain, particularly in the, in the back end, they'll sort of arch their back up and stand humped up with those ears flopped and head down. Uh, they vocalize, they're, they're crying for their mamas and those baby calves, or if somebody brushes up against them. Um, they may make some noise. Cush uh, is a term we use in, in camel, camelids, alpacas, and llamas. just means laying down. Uh, so again, reluctant to get up. And sometimes they'll just uh, even just lay down uh, flat on their side. Uh, and then with really severe pain, you can see rapid open mouth breathing. Um, and then some of the physiologic parameters, they'll have an increase in cortisol, uh, prolactin. They'll have a uh, um, what am I trying? They'll have a, a re release of catecholamines like uh, adrenaline, um, have a rapid heart rate, rapid respiration rates, uh, things that are pretty easily measured. Okay, uh, this is in dairy cattle and it comes out of Denmark, but it's, it's kind of interesting. So if you look at this cow right here, she's happy. She's bright and alert. Her ears are kind of sticking out like little airplane wings. Her, her face isn't wrinkled up. And, and that corresponds to this live animal here. If we look at this animal here, uh, you can see she's got some more wrinkles in her face. The, the muscles in her face are tense. Uh, her ears are starting to droop down a little bit. Some of the signs that you all mentioned, uh, you, you can see that here in this cow. And then uh, 
some animals actually their their ears will uh, kind of be pushed back like this and then you can see more more wrinkles flared nostrils along with the other physiologic signs uh, so you can see that in this case here and in this case up above so some the facial expressions are uh, becoming um, pretty useful to evaluate pain and, there, and and there's actually whole um, sort of scoring charts for for pain uh, that can be used and to assign a numeric value uh, based on observations and then decisions for pain mitigation can be made once uh, that number exceeds a certain threshold but you know basically down on the ranch we're going to look for these signs of pain but more importantly we're going to try and prevent these uh, events from occurring uh, in the first place. So what are the consequences of unmitigated pain? Obviously there's animal suffering. Uh, it's been well established that when there's severe pain because of the, the chemicals that are released not only from the site of the surgical uh, procedure but also from the brain that there is a delay in healing. Um, I mentioned that bulls being castrated going into a feedlot uh, had more susceptibility to respiratory disease. This is because pain actually results in suppression of the immune system. <clears throat> There's an increase in blood viscosity and, and dehydration. Um, pain inhibits normal behavior. We talked about the isolation, the, the poor appetite, and obviously that kind of sets up a, a downward spiral a calf that doesn't eat well, doesn't have a good immune response, is not gonna gain weight, he's more susceptible to disease. And uh, of course, uh, pain can precipitate abnormal behavior. Could be anything from uh, increased aggression, uh, just to a, a lack of uh, feeding behavior um, that can, can result in mismothering in the baby calves as well. So gonna kind of jump into some of the physiology here. And pain is a very complicated topic. The, the nerve pathways, the chemicals that are involved, uh, it, it goes far beyond my understanding. So we're just gonna kind of touch on the tip of the iceberg tonight, uh, try, trying really just to give you an understanding of why that preemptive pain mitigation is so important to, to get those drugs on board uh, before the painful event so that um, what we call wind up or sensitization doesn't occur. So uh, the responses of the nervous system to noxious stimuli, that could be um, temperature, pressure, uh, surgery, uh, chemicals like acid, uh, burns, extreme cold. Uh, that's what we call noxious stimuli. Uh, they're not static hardwired events. They change with time. And so, uh, we're going to introduce a concept shortly called sensitization or wind up. So what basically happens is uh, repeated or prolonged painful stimulation uh, lowers the pain threshold and cause, causes those nerves to fire and re release chemicals that uh, make it hurt more basically. And, and again, that's just a, a vicious cycle, more pain, more chemical release, uh, more chemical release, a lower threshold to pain, more nerve firing, more uh, perception of pain. Um, so those repeated stimuli can change the ability of the peripheral receptor. That's, uh, you know, that's the, the nerve endings at the surgical site to respond to a stimulus. The, that repeated stimulation actually makes it more and more painful. You've all had the um, uh, the experience of, you know, hurting, cutting your finger uh, you know, first, yeah, yeah, it hurts, it bleeds, but but the next day, just a light touch to that area really hurts, uh, and that's because of this uh, the stimuli that causes a peripheral sensitization. Uh, but also, there's a change in the perception of that response at the level of the brain. So, what would have normally been, ah, yeah, that kind of hurt, to God dang, that hurt. Uh, that happens in your brain, and that's a result of this wind-up phenomenon that comes from. Uh, not mitigating that pain early on. Okay, so we're going to spend a, a few minutes on this. Uh, <laughs> this diagram is actually a diagram of a horse, but just imagine it to be a long-tailed uh, calf. And um, so we're going to kind of start here with the nociceptor. Those are those nerve endings that pick up the signals from um, 
uh, extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, chemical irritation like acids uh, or um, inflammation due to surgery or infection. And so uh, there's those transducers and those nerve endings that uh, travel in these fibers called A gamma and C fibers. And uh, these, these fibers are relatively uh, high threshold. So it takes quite a bit of stimulation to get these boogers to fire off. But once they start firing, it takes less and less uh, stimulation to make them fire. And then we have uh, these low threshold fibers called uh, A beta fibers. These are the ones that, you know, you, you just touch something with your finger, you, you touch your finger to your face. Those are the fibers that uh, project those sensations. And um, so those don't take much to fire, but once these uh, um, A gamma and C fibers start firing, it even lowers the threshold to these. And then uh, these low threshold fibers in turn can lower the uh, firing threshold in these other fibers. So they have a kind of a mutual feedback thing. Anyway, these are called the afferent nerves and they have uh, their nerve cell bodies in, alongside the spine in what's called the dorsal root ganglion. And then the other side of those nerve cell bodies projects into the spinal cord. This is called the, uh, the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And it's there that they interact with other nerves. And at this point, the, um, the pain stimulations and signals are, are somewhat modulated. And so what happens down here with repeated stimulations, we call that peripheral sensitization. What happens up here is called central uh, um, uh, desensitization or, or the wind-up phenomena. We actually have drugs that, that work here, and then we have drugs that work down here. And then once these uh, impact in the dorsal root of the spinal cord, that projects up along the spinal cord to the brain, and then all kinds of complicated things happen in the brain. It, it projects to the cerebral cortex where the calf says, whoa, I feel that. And that elicits uh, escape reflexes or the kick reflex. Uh, um, it, it also sends projections down into the, to the hypothalamus and to the pituitary gland uh, to stimulate the release of, of, of cortisol and, and other hormones. Uh, um, and it, it also affects the immune system, but then it also uh, sends uh, fibers back down through the spinal cord uh, to this area in the dorsal horn that have uh, inhibitory uh, nerve fibers to, to help modulate this response. Uh, so that can uh, be, in, we can actually inhibit the inhibitory factors so that these uh, afferents, the, the stimulating or sensitization fibers uh, fire even more uh, and at lower thresholds. So a lot of these chemicals actually inhibit the inhibitory fibers. So uh, anyway, that'll give us an overview, a place to start. Uh, kind of went through that pretty fast. And like I say, that's just kind of the, the tip of the iceberg on this topic. So peripheral sensitization, that, that, was, uh, that would occur right down here at the site of the injury or stimulation. It results uh, from chemicals released from those damaged tissues and they, they go by all these, all these different names. Y'all are familiar with histamine. Um, that's what's in bee venom. And so um, when histamine gets in, into your skin, it causes uh, uh, what we call inflammation, which consists of increased blood flow, uh, pain, heat, swelling, and so uh, these chemicals are actually released from the nerve endings. It doesn't have to be a bee sting. So this in turn causes an increase in the sensitivity of those nerve endings. So it takes less and less uh, to cause them to fire. What normally uh, would take a lot of stimulation now takes just a, a brush or a touch. And when it goes on long enough, they actually, actually fire spontaneously. Uh, I think that's part of the phenomenon of, of a, a phantom limb where somebody say has an arm or a leg amputated and, and you know, their hand hurts or their foot itches. Uh, it's similar to that, even though that part of their anatomy is long gone. And so basically uh, those pain thresholds are uh, uh, greatly reduced. And so the perception of pain uh, takes less and less stimulation. In other words, the system becomes sensitized. 
And uh, we, we call that wind up. Uh, you'll hear that term used a lot in, in hospitals uh, when they uh, talk about post-surgical pain, they try to avoid wind up. Uh, so central sensitization uh, occurs after intense or repetitive nociceptor stimulation. So this occurs up in that dorsal horn of the spinal column. And so it results in a functional change of those neurons. Uh, so there's an increase in excitability. In other words, um, there's a decrease in the threshold that it takes to excite, excite those neurons that then send signals to the brain to perceive the pain, uh, or it can work um, with decreased inhibition. We talked about the descending inhibitory fibers. If, if they're inhibited, then uh, there's not much modulation of the pain and, and the system just sort of runs out of control uh, to cause a very severe pain. And this may be temporary, in most cases it is, or it can be permanent. I mentioned the, the idea of the phantom limb in somebody that's had a leg amputated. Uh, those can be permanent severe pains to those individuals if that uh, injury has gone on long enough. So basically the overall result is the painful sensation is exaggerated and prolonged. But the good news is we can prevent all this. We can prevent um, the peripheral sensitization with uh, local anesthetic drugs, and we could prevent the central sterilization uh, with a variety of uh, injectable and oral uh, medications. Um, one of the things that you may be familiar with this, this drug ketamine, it, it, it has become a popular street drug, which means that it's uh, now a, um, a scheduled substance highly regulated by the Drug Enforcement Administration. So it takes a, a DEA license and a prescription to get this drug. Um, but it, it actually uh, antagonizes this NMDA receptor, which is uh, the receptor in the dorsal horn of the spinal column. So uh, very low doses of ketamine actually prevent that uh, transmission of those nerve impulses up to the brain. And, and for that reason, it has analgesic properties. And um, we're using this a lot in cattle. There's a technique we call ket stun, where we mix ketamine with a little bit of rompin and a little bit of an opioid and, and inject all of those drugs at a very low dose into an animal. And uh, it, it's amazing the things that you can accomplish. Um, I've actually been using ketamine in horses with colic, just very low doses uh, to relieve their pain when they've been colicky for quite a while and they're getting that wind up phenomenon. And I've had just, uh, just really remarkable results in the few cases I've had to try that. But this is not something you're going to be using routinely. I just kind of want to mention that uh, because it, it is something that's available uh, to veterinarians to use on your animals. So I uh, want to emphasize the principle of preemptive pain management. In other words, getting the drugs on board before the painful stimulation or getting the drugs on board before that wind up or sensitization phenomenon occurs. And so uh, we can use lower doses and have a greater effect if we'll use these drugs before the pain sensations develop and become very severe. Also a combination approach is most effective. So what I mean by this, say, we, say we're dehorning or castrating, we can use a local anesthetic at the time of surgery um, to prevent the acute, phase, the acute phase of that pain, but then give a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, basically an aspirin type drug uh, to provide pain relief for several days afterward because that local anesthetic is only gonna last from 20 minutes uh, to about an hour. And so in studies they've done with using local anesthetics, uh, particularly in calf castrations, there's really no long-term benefit of using the local, it's just the calves don't jump around and feel that acute pain. But if we'll combine that with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like banamine or aspirin or meloxicam, uh, it's much more effective. Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to manage really chronic pain like, like the kind we get with, uh, oh, when they get um, infection down in their coffin joint or they get a stifle injury uh, we do use uh, combinations of non-steroidals and a, a drug like uh, gabapentin, um, but um, it, it's not, not nearly as effective as managing pain early on in the pain process. So just kind of a, a way to remember 
uh, an approach to pain management is what's called the three S approach. And uh, the S's are suppress, substitute, and soothe. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time on soothing pain, but, but I wanted to just make mention of these other um, legs of this um, tripod here. So suppressing means eliminate pain events when possible or use a, a technique that uh, is a little bit less painful. So eliminate painful events that really don't benefit the animal. And uh, when you think on this, you can, can come up with a, a couple ideas. Uh, they may not be practical to your operation, but they will be to some people. We can uh, eliminate the pain of dehorning by using pulled genetics. Obviously, if there's no horns to take off, we won't have to have our animals experience that painful procedure. Uh, same thing goes with castration. If you're raising your own replacement heifers, uh, you might want to breed some of your uh, top cows that you'd like to retain a heifer calf from with sex semen if you're, if you're doing AI. Uh, obviously, we don't need to castrate heifer calves. Um, it's been shown that freeze branding is less painful than hot iron branding. So again, this probably goes against some tradition in, in some of our um, ranch situations, but uh, just something to consider uh, the use of freeze branding versus hot iron branding. So that's suppressing the pain, uh, just basically either using a less painful procedure or avoiding the painful procedure altogether by uh, animal selection. The second S is substitute. So we substitute a less painful procedure or technique for one that was more painful. And so one of the, the biggest principles here is to both castrate and disbud or dehorn at as young of an age as feasible. Um, just like little baby boys are circumscribed, <laughs> circumscribed, circumcised, uh, you know, when they're a few days or, or a week old, and uh, there's, there's not much pain mitigation uh, needed for that. If they wait until they're teenagers, uh, it's a whole different story. They're gonna have to shoot them with a dart gun to get them to hold still. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention with dehorning is uh, if you're scooping those horns out um, either, or, or using um, um, a dehorning saw or a barns gouge or a tube dehorner, if you go ahead and use your hot iron uh, um, dehorning uh, to cauterize that area. It actually seals off those nerves and there'll be less long-term uh, pain uh, rather than just pulling those arteries out with forceps in those, in those big horns if you're doing them at that age. And then lastly, soothe the pain. This is where we're going to be using drugs and chemicals, uh, using preemptive pain medication and using combination therapy or a multimodal approach. And we're gonna get into some of the details on that. So what tools do we actually have? And by tools, I mean, uh, what drugs do we have? So a uh, flinixing megalamine, that's uh, what you know is banamine, or there's a generic out there called Prevail. And uh, it's the only non, this stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's the only drug that's approved for use in cattle. And the only uh, approval is for the poron or the transdermal. It's approved for uh, treatment of fever and endotoxemia associated with mastitis and uh, pneumonia in cattle. Uh, it's uh, not approved for dairy cattle over 20 months. So, uh, and it's also um, the injectable form is labeled for fever associated with bovine respiratory disease, endotoxemia and mastitis. So you see there's nothing here approved uh, for pain mitigation for routine procedures like castration, dehorning, and branding. So other approved analgesic compounds are just not, not available. They are in other countries, uh, but they're not here. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the main reasons is uh, a lack of really um, effective, objective, mechanisms to evaluate the response to pain mitigation. Uh, the FDA wants to look at data. They don't wanna look at, uh, well, I think they were less painful or they acted like they were more alert. They want hard numbers and those numbers are really hard to come by when we talk about pain mitigation. So at least in this country, as severe as the FDA is on drug approvals, that's, that's the main reason. We just don't have good ways of assessing uh, pain and the differences between treated animals and non-treated animals. But we do have a lot of drugs uh, available to us for pain relief, and they're used under 
something called AMDUCA and ELUD. So obviously this is government speak. They got lots of these acronyms and uh, abbreviations. This stands for Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act. And so Congress actually enacted this many years ago and it allows us uh, to use our professional judgment in using drugs that are approved in animals for other species or other indications or other doses or for different durations. And we can use them in an extra label drug use manner. Uh, but bear in mind that to use these drugs, it does take a valid veterinarian client patient relationship and a written prescription uh, from the veterinarian to use these drugs. Doesn't mean the veterinarian has to administer them, but they would be responsible for helping you learn the proper way to use them and then uh, being available for follow-up if there are adverse reactions and advising you on proper withdrawal times. So uh, over here on the left, here's a whole big long list of drugs that can be used uh, for pain relief. Some of these you'll recognize, some of them you probably won't. But what we're gonna talk about this evening is, is just a couple different things. I mentioned the, the poron or the transdermal banamine. Um, this drug works very well. It's not exactly cheap, um, but it's something that, you know, you could pour on a calf, uh, the minute you rope that calf and, and drag them to the branding uh, fire or have them tied up to, to castrate, you could just pour the banamine right on his back. It's probably not the most effective approach, uh, but it's sure better than doing nothing. We can use injectable banamine. The downside here is that it has to be given IV. And uh, some of you are really good at giving IVs and, and some of you have not uh, learned how to do that uh, real efficiently. If it gets outside the vein, it can cause severe muscle necrosis. It can result in uh, a clostridial myositis, basically black leg in the neck or the area where you give it. And so unless you're get, uh, good at giving IV injections, it's probably not a good option for you. So lidocaine, that's the local anesthetic, just like your dentist might use a xylocaine. Um, it's just another uh, name for lidocaine. It comes as a 2% solution. Uh, this drug is relatively inexpensive. None of these are controlled substances. Uh, and then the last drug is, is meloxicam. This comes as an oral liquid. It comes as an injectable and it comes as an oral tablet. And we mainly use these oral tablets. The other forms are pretty darn expensive but the tablets are dirt cheap. And I'll show you how dirt cheap these tablets are in a minute. Basically, we use three of these itty bitty tablets per hundred pounds of calf. And they're just, they only cost a few cents each. The good thing about using meloxicam in cattle is it has a very long duration of activity. It lasts uh, for up to three days. It actually binds to the food particles, particularly in a calf that started to ruminate a little bit. Uh, it will bind to those food particles and be released slowly into his system and provide prolonged pain relief. So we can block the horns, we can block the testes uh, with lidocaine so he doesn't feel those procedures, uh, give it an oral dose of meloxicam and that calf's good to go for three days. And usually within three days, the intensity of that pain has subsided so you really don't see any side effects. Again, this is preemptive pain management. It'll prevent that central and peripheral sensitization or wind up and uh, the, these calves uh, will look happy and healthy and uh, not have any setbacks as the result of the surgical intervention. So local anesthetics like lidocaine, uh, they work at that site of transduction at the noce receptor uh, and prevent those uh, uh, alpha gamma and the C fibers from sending those transmissions up to the uh, ganglion and to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and projecting to the brain. So we basically nip this in the bud. Basically, the problem with local anesthetics is they just don't last long. Uh, they're very inexpensive. They're very effective. Um, the, other, the other downside is they take a little bit of time to work. If you've ever had a, a root canal or a tooth pulled or drilled, you know, the dentist will give you your shot and then, then he disappears for a while. And he comes back in five, 10 minutes, usually seems like an hour that he's been gone and it gives it time to take effect. And so I mentioned one of the, uh, the reasons that producers are reluctant to use uh, pain relief, especially local anesthetics, 
is the idea that it takes a long time to work. Uh, and I'll even show you a video here at the end where they repeat over and over, it takes three to five minutes. It, it probably does for the horn block, but when we're talking about castration and injecting this drug right into the testis or into the spermatic cord, it's worked by the time you pull your needle out. It's, it's pretty much instantaneous. So uh, that really should not be a, a deterrent to you. You don't have to wait that long. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatories they alleviate pain, they slow down tissue damage, they actually inhibit an enzyme that is responsible for the body making the chemicals that cause inflammation. They also reduce pain sensitivity, so uh, they help prevent that wind up phenomena, and, and of course, uh, they uh, help prevent the development of a fever. So, again, multimodal approach using a local anesthetic with a non steroidal is the most effective pain management that we're able to provide on a practical basis. And using a drug like meloxicam that has a prolonged duration of activity is, um, is very beneficial. Uh, it's not practical to catch a calf every 12 hours. Uh, if you're gonna use aspirin, you have to give it every six hours and we've used aspirin for years, but it's really not very, very effective for um, any long-term pain relief. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about meloxicam. Uh, this drug is used in humans and basically all species. It's a non-steroidal shown to be effective in relieving pain and the distress that comes along with pain, following both dehorning and castration of cattle. And I, I stress that it has a long duration of effect, up to three days. It's really easy to give. I'll give you a couple of uh, ideas how you can get these little tablets into a baby calf without too much hassle. It's dirt cheap, has about a three week uh, slaughter time. But again, bear in mind, it's not approved. And so you'll need a prescription from your veterinarian to use this. Doesn't mean your veterinarian has to give it, just has to provide the drug and provide instruction for you to use it properly. So um, just to kind of back up, uh, we, we, we said that pain mitigation is often not incorporated because of the idea that it, it's expensive. And some of those drugs really are expensive but lidocaine and meloxicam are pretty inexpensive. I actually looked up the prices, the producers on Valley Vet um, uh, website. Of course, we, we can get them quite a bit cheaper here, but the Valley Vet is gonna mark things up. So uh, a bottle of lidocaine is just over $7. Uh, so if we use 10 cc's of lidocaine to block the testes and spermatic cords, that comes up to 70 cents. Um, an 18 gauge needle and a 10 ml syringe comes up to about 23 cents, although I've seen needles a lot cheaper than that. Meloxicam tablets, as I said, they're four to five cents each, three tablets per 100 pounds. So uh, 100 pound calf, 85 pound calf, we just, we just round up, give it three tablets, a total of 15 cents for the meloxicam, three days of relief for 15 cents, that's a bargain. The grand total adds up to just over a dollar. So is pain relief uh, and animal welfare worth a dollar a head? I, I think it is. So how do we get that meloxicam into them? Um, actually, these tablets dissolve pretty easy in water. If, if you're not in a big hurry, you can drop a couple tablets into a syringe and add some, some warm water and shake it and then squirt it in their mouth. Um, this is a device you can make out of a, a dowel rod, a piece of a PVC tubing or PEX type. And then um, this kind of works like a syringe. Notice that the dowel has a string and a washer attached to it. So it doesn't slide down the esophagus of the calf and have to be retrieved. And so um, anyway, you can just use a piece of this PEX pipe and a dowel and put, put marks on the outside. You can cut a slit so you can see it like they've shown here. So um, this would be where three tablets go. Uh, if, you, if you're doing 200 pound calves, you'd want to use Six, six tablets, 300 pound calves, nine tablets. So you can cut a slit and then just put a mark at each 100 pound increment and then, and then just dump the tablets in. That, that goes really fast. Another option is to use gelatin capsules. So you can have family night uh, before dehorning and disbudding. So get all the kids and the grandkids around the kitchen table, pour out the meloxicam tablets and uh, depending on what size calves you'll be working, just put them into the appropriate size gelatin capsule. These are really inexpensive, uh, several of them for one cent. 
put the little tablets inside the gelatin capsule, and then you can administer that with your little calf balling gun. Let's see, I see something in the chat. Let me see what's going on here. <clears throat> Let's see. We provide probiotic paste to our calves at birth, and that works really well for administering the meloxicam to calves. Hey, that's a great idea. I really appreciate that tip. So I assume you just kind of mix the uh, meloxicam tablets, crush the tablets and, and mix it, or are you using a, a liquid formulation of meloxicam? All we do, Chuck, is we take those three tablets and stick them into the neck of the of the, the probiotic tube, give it two, two squeezes and you're done. Great, great idea. And you know, um, I'll mention later on, but for many years we've had this perception that if we leave those testicles on the calves longer, they're gonna gain faster and grow better. Uh, recent research has shown that uh, there's no advantage to leaving those testicles to those calves or three months or six months. So. If you're, if you're going out and tagging your calves or giving them probiotics the morning after they're born, um, you, can, you can certainly mix the meloxicam with this probiotic paste. That's a great idea. I'm going to keep that one in the back of my mind. Thank you. Let's see. Let me go back here. Okay. Uh, so transdermal banamine, we've talked about that. It's the first approved drug label for pain in cattle. Um, became approved three years ago uh, for foot rot and then also uh, fever, inflammation, endotoxemia, but there, there's actually no mention of pain, but uh, we, we, since this drug is approved, we can use it in an extra label fashion. Uh, some of the limitations on the label, uh, say for use in steers, beef heifers, beef cows, and beef bulls uh, intended for slaughter, not intended for breeding, can use it in replacement dairy heifers up to 20 months. Uh, they say not for use in beef bulls for breeding, dairy bulls or female dairy cattle over 20 months, um, and, and suckling beef calves, dairy calves and beef calves, veal calves. So um, the label does not cover how we're going to use it, but we do have that leeway under the AMDUCA ELUD uh, Act. So um, basically, <clears throat> To kind of put it this way, this is illegal, but they're not going to enforce it. They totally turn uh, their eyes the other way. They don't care if you use these drugs in an extra label use in this manner. We all know it's illegal, but nobody really cares. The FDA doesn't care. They got way bigger fish to fry than uh, veterinarians using these approved drugs in an extra label drug use manner. So. Uh, kind of going to go over some of the, <clears throat> the techniques and uh, how to mitigate pain. So we'll begin with castration. <clears throat> uh, we can use romp and the sedatum if they're really jumping around. Uh, that's, that's rarely done. Usually it's just physical restraint in a chute or uh, uh, tied up with ropes. <coughs> we use a lidocaine in the cord and the testicles, and, and uh, we can even inject it into the skin of the scrotum. Um, Toxic dose is about six to 10 milligrams per kilogram. So uh, there's 20 milligrams per cc in lidocaine. The average calf weighs about um, 45 kilograms. So basically what I do is I take the calf's weight in pounds and divide by four. So a hundred pound calf, it takes about a, a fourth of his weight in pounds in cc's to kill it. So uh, we could use up to 25 cc's in a hundred pound calf. Uh, if we go above that, we run the risk of killing it, just to give you an idea of how much is too much. Um, the toxic dose might be a little bit less around the horn uh, because the uptake's pretty rapid, um, but I think the uptake's pretty rapid in the spermatic cords too. Um, we can use banamine, either injectable or pour on. Again, banamine is more expensive. It doesn't last as long. My drug of choice is the meloxicam given orally with that three-day duration. Uh, I mentioned Ketstun, which is actually a mixture of ketamine, xylazine, and butorphanol, which is an opioid. Uh, low dose of all three, either given in the muscle or given in the vein. Um, and those big bulls pretty much stand still and let you do almost anything you want to them. Um, but uh, we're really talking about calves tonight, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. So castration, uh, this is some guidelines from the American Association of Bovine Practitioners. Some of you may recognize their logo here. And uh, most all veterinarians that work with cattle are, uh, are members of this organization and have these, this information available. So uh, they actually have recently 
publish uh, guidelines for castration and dehorning of calves, and they discuss why do it. Um, the age of castration, why younger is better, castration technique, and pain mitigation. <clears throat> so obvious, the obvious question is why do we castrate calves? Uh, well, it reduces aggressiveness. That's a big one, uh, both toward other animals and toward you and I. Uh, obviously, bulls can be dangerous. And then uh, it reduces sexual activity. So when they go into the feedlot, uh, so we, we, we say it changes their mind uh, from screwing to chewing. So uh, they're more concerned with, with eating than they are finding heifers to breed. So uh, we know that uh, there's a modification of carcass characteristic in steers versus bulls. There's a reduced number of dark cutters. Those are the ones that have high lactic acid and uh, that, that meat becomes very dark, which is uh, not acceptable to consumers, even though you and I probably know it doesn't taste any different. And uh, it improves quality grade when animals are castrated. So they'll have, a, a, they'll have more animals uh, grading uh, choice, high choice and prime. Uh, versus the select or lower grade animals um, if, if we go ahead and cast around. So the, the bottom line is that steer carcasses are just plain worth more than bull carcasses uh, once they go to the packing plant. So that's why we do it. So age at castration, I, I've said this over and over. I hope you really get this message. Um, the younger they are, the less stressful it is to them. So when we do them young, we greatly reduce the stress. Uh, so basically you kind of have to fit this into your own operations management. If you're out there tagging calves the next morning uh, and you got somebody to fend off the maternal uh, fight of the mama while you're working on that calf, you can go ahead and slip a band around those testicles. Just takes a, takes a minute uh, on that first day. But uh, certainly castrating uh, up to three months of age is ideal. So uh, most of the calves in our part of the country uh, attend the branding party at around three months of age. So um, I think a lot of calves also get castrated at that stage. So after three months, then, then uh, it's much more stressful to the animal. So, and I, get, I mentioned again, there are no proven benefits of delaying castration to improve growth. Okay, so moving on to dehorning the guidelines again from AABP. Um, Pain management should be considered the standard of care, not something optional, something that we should come to uh, incorporate into our routine procedures uh, and make it a habit. So uh, we use local anesthesia, uh, either the, the horn nerve block called the corneal block uh, or just infiltration around the horn bud uh, and that skin around the horn bud. And I'll show you how, that, how this is done. Uh, you can have your vet train you. Um, uh, you and your co-workers, and then also provide that systemic pain relief uh, using either topical uh, banamine or IV banamine um, or the oral medication. Again, I prefer meloxicam oral for its long duration. And again, you'll need a prescription. So this demonstrates uh, the local block for dehorning. I'll also show it, you a video, um, but this shows the anatomy. The, the corneal nerve is a branch of the facial nerve and it, it comes up uh, along the side of the face and then it, it eventually runs along that ridge uh, of the skull between the, the corner of the eye and the base of the horn. And so that's where we go ahead and inject. So here you can see a calf being restrained, feeling that ridge between the eyeball and where the horn bud is located and then uh, injecting right on the underside of that ridge. Usually uh, three, four, five cc's is plenty so we're nowhere near the toxic dose. And I like this angle of attack. Some of the videos I looked at, they were going straight in or, or even from the back toward the nose. But I like going from sort of the eye toward the base of the horn, pushing that anesthetic up toward the base of the horn. Uh, you can also just inject this around the base of the, the horn. Uh, that works. Uh, but I, I think the corneal block is probably the, the most effective. Uh, let's see. So I got a little video here, hope this one works. Okay. Uh, it worked a minute ago. Uh, let me see, if I exit this mode, it might work. Let's see, hang on, let me go back here. I really want you to see this video.
Here we go. Uh, Dr. <clears throat> John Lasker, Ty County Animal Clinic. Today we're going to discuss corneal nerve blocking and baby carriers for short-term pain mitigation. Do remember that lidocaine blocking is only going to last 20 to 30 minutes, so there needs to be a long-term pain medication. That's kind of recommendation is three superfluent tablets and naloxone and 100 pounds of body weight. This gas already been blocked partially, so we're going to use generally five cc per child on a corneal nerve. Locating the corneal nerve, I'm going to feel right here into the bud and then the lateral campus of the eye. So the lateral campus of the eye and the bud are your exterior markers. I usually use between an inch and inch and a half needle, the smallest gauge possible. There's a crest right here that runs between this lateral campus and this horn bud right there in the center is where I'm going to aim and come right off that ridge. So, lateral campus, horn bud, facial ridge, and I'm going to dive right in here. And inject, just kind of go with the jam. If you get a blood back, you know, just always check for blood before you inject. Same thing on this side, lateral campus, down here, horn bud, facial crest, inject. Pull back, no blood. That's a wrap. Wait five minutes. I usually do three to five casts at a time, depending on speed, and then come back to the first cast and start my dispatch. Okay. I mentioned uh, this previously, but um, if you use a gouge dehorner, uh, go ahead and uh, heat up that hot iron dehorner too and just cauterize that wound uh, afterwards. and. Uh, they found looking at cortisol again, which is a, a marker of the stress of the calf, that um, using that um, cauterization uh, abolished that cortisol response for 24 hours in three to four month old calves. So, you know, these calves had horns sticking up there two to three inches uh, or two inches anyway. In addition, uh, there's uh, much less blood loss, uh, less attraction to uh, flies and uh, no complications of dirt during wound healing. Cauterizing after scoop dehorning in five to six month old calves. So these guys have those horns out there four or five inches long. Um, produces a rise in plasma cortisol associated with the pain. But when it was combined with a local anesthetic, again, the cortisol response was virtually abolished uh, throughout the nine hour uh, observation period after the dehorning was done. So. Um, go ahead and use the corneal block and then uh, zap it with that hot iron and then I'll give them some meloxicam and you've done a good thing for those calves. <clears throat> so on the castration, this is how local anesthetic can be injected. Uh, it's a good idea if you don't use a ropes or a calf uh, tilt table for restraint, have somebody uh, jack that calf's tail up if he's just in a chute, but you can inject it um, into the spermatic cord um, right above the testicle, you can feel that rope-like structure. You can inject it there. Uh, you can even inject it right into the testicle. Uh, either way works. Uh, so you in inject uh, the left spermatic cord and then inject the right spermatic cord. And if you want, you can put a little bit uh, right there in the middle. Uh, and like I say, this injection into the spermatic cord is just about instantaneous. The injection of the skin uh, takes, a, takes a few minutes, but Usually when we're working calves, we're doing other things. You know, we're giving uh, vaccines, um, identifying the calf, tagging them. So going ahead and, and getting the local anesthetic in first thing while the rest of the crew does the other procedures will give a little bit of time to take effect before you go ahead and, and actually perform the castration. So I uh, want to show you this little video uh, using a local block and the Henderson tool. We're looking at techniques that really are trying to mitigate any problems with safety for us and safety for the animal. And it's an animal welfare issue that we're really trying to make this a less invasive process for the animal. And so using lidocaine as a block is what allows us, in this particular case, of these young calves over here, 
allows us and allows them to go through the procedure with less pain. And that's really what the design of this is, is find a oh, not pain-free but less painful procedure for castration in this case. So use the lidocaine allows us to do that. And then we show the technique here to producers and to veterinarians how to do that. I think that you know they want to process cattle as quick as possible. So what we're trying to do is to show that you can do this procedure and have the, the lidocaine take effect in three to five minutes and then be able to do the procedure. Um, so it's a quick procedure, but they want to move cattle through the shoot as quickly as possible. So we're giving them an option here that would probably fit their system. The thing about the drill technique, it's easy, it's fast, um, and as long as you know how to work it, it's really quick. Um, it also does a lot from the standpoint of diminishing blood loss. Um, that's where we see it a little bit more of a test issue. Um, with the with respect to banding, where we see probably the highest cases of tetanus, but uh, uh, producers love it because there's no blood when they leave the shoe, nothing's dripping. The only blood that we really see is from the scrotum where we actually make the incision. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really nice as well. So about two to five minutes, we know lidocaine starts working um, and probably full effect by five minutes. Um, the, a lot of times when producers or whoever's running the shoot, they have other things to do, whether it's vaccination and planning, boring. So by the time you inject and do the rest of your stuff, you can come back and it should be full effect of the lidocaine. So about two to five minutes. So the Henderson tool itself, the clamp part is about 180 bucks. Uh, Stone Manufacturing makes it. And then a drill, um, I got a question about what size of drill, how big. Um, and really all you need is a 14 year old uh, drill. Um, you can buy those for about 90 bucks at any hardware store. Um, the lighter ones are nicer just because you have to hold on to it. Um, you get to the bigger, heavier ones. They're a little bit more clumsy to work in. So the same principle exists. Younger is going to be better with yeah, this type definitely. of use always. Yeah, this is not a, something that allows you to wait to do the practice. Right, right. If they have the capability. I mean, the Henderson has the capability of doing big, big animals, but obviously we don't want to promote that um, because the Henderson tool can actually be worked on horses too. So they're doing them at a year, year or two years of age before they castrate horses. So we know we can have the capability of doing that, but we don't want to promote that. We want to definitely do smaller, smaller cats. Okay, last thing I want to mention is uh, something that's not available to you yet. It's uh, <clears throat> called Noceta in the veterinary line. It's actually a, a liposomal bupivacaine. And uh, we're using this a lot in our small animal patients and some in equine. Um, the advantage of it is it lasts for three days. It's pretty darn expensive. Uh, hopefully, as it becomes more commonplace, uh, the cost of it will come down, but basically, Using this as a local anesthetic block will provide uh, 72 hours of pain relief. I use this on all my dog cesarean sections. And uh, when we do that, just inject this along the incision line. We don't have to give any other pain relief and the dogs, they, they really do just fine. So just mention that you may see something uh, on that in the future. So that's all I had and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chuck. That was a really good presentation. Um, I would ask you if you can explain a little bit more how that Henderson tool works. At least on my side, the video wasn't super clear. Is that a drill? Can you uh, develop a little bit how that works? Yeah, the, the Henderson tool was, was actually invented by a rancher, uh, not a veterinarian. And um, it, it consists, it's, it's basically like a pliers. Um, the, the jaws, clamp above the testicle. They don't crush it like an emasculator. All they do is hold the uh, spermatic cord in its teeth, and then that's attached to a drill. And then uh, you isolate the spermatic cord and start the drill rotating slowly. And I actually counted how many rotations it takes before the cord breaks. It takes about 40 spins uh, in most calves. If, when you were a kid, you ever had one of those airplanes with a rubber band wind-up propeller? Um, you know how when you keep winding, it'll eventually break. And when it does that, elastic just retracts. Well, the arteries in a calf's uh, spermatic cord has elastic in the walls. And when you stretch it by that spinning, 
uh, until it breaks, the elastic makes that artery just retract and it, and it seals it off. It, it's 100% effective. They don't bleed one little bit. Uh, like, like Dr. Doman said in the video, the only bleeding you'll see is from the incision in the castration, whether you whop off the bottom of the scrotum or whether you, you use a Newberry knife to uh, split it uh, front to back. Um, works very effectively. Just to give you an idea, before I moved to Oregon in 02, I was faculty at Mississippi State and we had a beef master producer. He ran about 600 mama cows and so um, we would usually have about 300 calves to castrate and he, he let them get up pretty good size, three or four months. And we were doing them on a calf tilt table and had their legs secured. And for years we did them with an emasculator, uh, which crushes the cord, uh, commonly used in horses. And beef master calves are a little bit wild. So they would leave that calf table and go and run around. And typically we would have a three to 4% death loss. So would usually lose a dozen calves. We switched one year to the Henderson tool. And ever since that, we had zero death loss. The calves that died from the masculine, they bled to death. They got the jumping around and those arteries started bleeding. But once we switched to the Henderson tool, the death loss went to absolute zero. So it's a great tool. We use it on horses, pigs, goats, sheep, calves. It comes in, I think, three different sizes. That's very interesting. Thank you for uh, the clarification. Yep. Uh, I do have one more question here, and it's basically about for how long should you treat uh, animal after castration or dehorning? So if you can follow up with a pain mitigation procedure, for how long should you uh, treat them if you can, I guess? That's a great question. Um, if you're doing young calves, castrating and dehorning, by young I'm talking calves, say under four months of age, um, local anesthetic and a single dose of meloxicam at the time of the procedure is adequate. If you're doing larger calves or, or bulls, then and, and they can be available to get them back through the chute, then a second administration two to three days later of the meloxicam orally uh, should be long enough to kind of get them through that really painful period. Hmm. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. I don't see any other questions here on the chat or on the question and answer box. I don't know if you, can you check if you have anything just to make sure we're not missing anything? I don't see any other questions, Dr. Ranches. Okay, so thank you, Chuck. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. I think everybody else did. Uh, I'm glad to have you tonight. Okay. Hope you have a good night. Everybody up. Good night. See y'all. Bye. Oh, wait, I see a chat. Something in the chat here. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, thanks from Shelby. You're welcome, Shelby. Anytime. Good night. Thank you. Good night.